This is tape two of a two-part series on Revelation 4 and 5. If you missed the first teaching, go on back one. It's pretty good. Father, give us wisdom and revelation. Open our eyes to see this. Bring us to the next level that we need to be at, each person individually. Quite often people see different things while looking at the same thing. And in Revelation, it comes that way too. Human beings, they come into the kingdom of God. Well, they're at different levels or different places. And a good shepherd sees that. Apostle, prophet, they should. And accommodate them in that area. And Father, we thank you for doing that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Let's turn to the fifth chapter of Revelation. The fifth chapter of Revelation. Revelation chapter 5. Well, in our last teaching, in our time together, and today we will talk about them. When we were together in the fourth chapter, we're, we were introduced to the throne of God. As it is symbolically portrayed, symbols. We laid out some simple principles for understanding this significant book. You know, it has been. It's very significant. And we talked about the nature of signs and symbols and the sign not being the, the thing, but pointing to it. That's why Jesus came with signs and wonders. Wonder what that is. It's a sign. It points to it. If you listen and read perceptively in the last study, you would have noticed that the emphasis of chapter 4 is on God as the creator. And that the closing words of praise, laudation to God, has to do with the fact that, that he created all things. He was the creator of it all. Creatorial character of God is one which we as evangelicals which identifies most of us listening to this, I presume, somehow we lost the, we neglected it, let's say that. We have been great at, uh, at emphasizing God's redemption that we've done. We've almost considered his creation as something profane, it's improper, it's because of, of course, what Satan's done to it. But the Bible's full of references to creation and a creation motif the figures large in the New Testament. Now, let's think about this. Think about this for a minute. You create something wonderful. Let's say you put together a car. It's sort of simple. It's a beautiful car. Everything is majestic on it. You've done your best. And this is humanly speaking. I mean, the paint job's perfect. Not a flaw. Not a dent. Not anything. Motor. Drivetrain. Tires. Upholstery. Electronics. It's just wonderful. This kid wants to drive it. You're not home. You've told him before, stay away from it. Because he's irresponsible. He tears things up. Well, you go on a vacation. You have to go someplace or working, whatever. You come back and you go to check things out and you look around. Your car is about a thousand dents in it. Little dents and dings and scars and paint chipped off. Tires are torn up. Size of them been, well, it may have been some hard hard running on those things, you open the door and look inside and there's trash everywhere. The poster's been cut. Somebody wore keys or sent something in their pocket every time they got in, they slapped the car up. Candy, junk everywhere. The upholstery's messed up. All the hardware's messed up. The electronic doesn't work and your big screen that you have up there has coke poured all over it and it's, it's not working. Nothing seems to work. Started up and doesn't have any oil left in it. It's seized up. It's not electric, it's a gas. Somebody has torn up your machine. And sometimes I think that people think about the earth like that. The, the earth is just all torn up. What is, what's God thinking? God's not thinking about this. He gave it to a kid. Kid gave it to a nasty angel, and nasty angels tore things apart. And that's what we're looking at. And even in the majesticness of that, it's beautiful. And that's in, in heaven and earth. But the creation becomes a everlasting example of divine power. That's where I've been going with this. You can't look at that torn up car. you got to look 
beyond it. What what did he do it? God as the creator spoke the material universe into existence. He did. And again and again when God's people found themselves in in hard places and hard times, somehow because of their trials and problems, they couldn't discern God in the darkness. They couldn't find him, feel him, touch him. They were made to reach out and ever to the creation. That's what they look at as the great stimulus to their faith. Look, at, look around, look at the creation. The God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in between. He's a mighty God. He's a big God. So the creation motif is very important. In chapter 4, it celebrates creation. That's what we looked at. It sets God right in the heart of it. Right in the middle of it. He did it. He's in the middle of it. And he didn't make it like he see it. The throne of God is the control center of the cosmos. All things are ordered by that throne. Nothing goes through, nothing comes out here if it goes through that throne. Now we come into chapter 5, we move from the realm of creation and providence into the realm of redemption. So let's expose our hearts to it now. Let the word of God talk to us. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. A scroll, not a book. They didn't have books in those days. They had scrolls. A scroll written inside and on the back. They didn't do that. Usually, the ancients didn't write on both sides. They only wrote on one side. But this has its own significance, too. And it was sealed with seven seals. Seven. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who's worthy? Who's worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the scrolls or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he's conquered so as to open the scroll and the seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to, to, into all the earth. And he came and he took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book and the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying this where they art thou to take these scrolls to break his seals for thou hast slain and thou didst purchase for god with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nations and thou hast made them to be a kingdom of priests to our god and they will reign upon the earth and i looked and i heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads of myriads of thousands of thousands same with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in, in, everywhere i heard them saying to him sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing, honor, and glory, and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, 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 and Amen, and Amen. Say it, Amen, so be it. Amen, 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 Amen. <laughs> and the elders fell down and worshipped him. Hmm. Wow. Wow, that's an Amen right there. Oh, that's a mouthful. Amen, just to see it. 
just have it to give it to us. What a picture. Amen. Now, John was, John has recorded for us up to this point and described a, what the throne and all significant companies are like. The throne and everything around it. So now something else reaches his vision and he zeroes on to the throne. He notices that in the right hand of him who sits upon the throne, there is a, a scroll in his right hand. He sees this, so it must be a symbolic of something, this whole thing, because if you remember, in his first description of God was like a diamond and sardis, blood red sardis. That's his first description. It was like, he said, like, it was kind of was magnificent gems, beautiful. And when form they appeared, how they impressed him, I don't, I don't know, but I know he saw it, and then he saw this. And at some point in this vision, the one who sits on the throne somehow evolved some kind of an anthropomorphic form right there. You know how dreams are. He has a hand now. He was a diamond a while back, a blood diamond. And one, one of the things you must do when you're reading is to, and reading a book like Revelation, you must be prepared for a shift, a kind of a change, quick change, because we're in the realm of, of signs and wonders and signs. And I simplistically try to explain it like your dreams change. And they rapidly change from one place to a one place in one phase of a dream. And, and by some strange chemistry, I don't know what happens, you're in another. Boom, you're there. It's somehow related, but it's different. You know, dreams. We're in a different realm. Um, I'd like to explain it, but I can't. most of it I can't. Now, the one who sits upon the throne has a hand. And on that hand rests a scroll. Hmm. The scroll is described for us. And it, uh, it is described as being written on both sides. And I said, and as I said before, scrolls don't usually written on both sides. Huh. And it's God's right hand that this is, this is symbolic. And it's sealed with seven seals. It's symbolic again. So this scroll rests in the right hand of God. We have a symbolism right here, right hand of God. We're told that Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Now, I don't want to be irreverent, but I do want to, I want to be as clear as I can. Jesus is not literally sitting on God's hand. You know that, <laughs> you know that. We know that even if he retains some kind of material idea that he's sitting here at his right hand, that's where he's sitting. So the right hand is, in our, in our normal ways of using it, refers to a place of favor and strength. Sit at my right hand, you have favor here. The mother went, the well, mother wanted something for her son, and said, said Jesus, I want I want him to sit at my right hand, and the other one left. He wasn't in, she, she wasn't interested with her son sitting at Jesus' right hand and his left hand, but that the sons should have the preeminence and authority and power and prestige and recognition that, that goes with those who have the right to sit on the right and the left. Yeah, that's what she wanted for the boys. So the scroll is in the place of supreme power. There is, uh, there's no greater symbol of ultimate authority and power than the right hand of God. That's ultimate power. The scroll is resting in the right hand of God. It's sealed with seven seals. A seal stands for security. A seal stands for ownership. The seal stands for secrecy, among other things. The seal. If you look closely on that seal, you'll see a imprimata, a stamp, imprint, initial of Almighty God on it, stamped right on it. And I remember as a young man, we used to send letters to once in a while. We'd send to each other. We had a seal and you had a ring that was set up. We got this as a toy, but it wasn't a toy. This is from the, this is from the days, but it goes all the way back. And I was asking, as we passed these letters back and forth to school, because they were sealed. You can't open that a secret. And I wonder, what, what is that? This is this is private and secret. Only your girlfriend or your friend's supposed to open those. 
and melt that wax and put it on a little puddle on the crease of the envelope and then we'd take our little seal ring which we got these these were toys and we push it into it and lift it off i don't know how they thought what they were thinking these kids with matches or whatever what we did we melted them. that was a seal a secret now there were seven seals on this scroll number seven wow means something if you look closely you would have seen the divine initial and, and uh that scroll belonged to god you would also notice that there was something very forbidding about that scroll because it's in a place of security and power and uh, nobody's gonna empty at all grab it nobody's gonna grab it you won't do it you can inquire can i look at that no there's something about the whole thing that's awesome and forbidding and as you stand there in the presence of myriads of angels and these strange living creatures and these crowned 24 elders and the sea of glass and the rainbow and all this magnificent panoramic view of tableau and, and gorgeous uh, solemnness it's a solemn occasion and you see that scroll with the seven seals it stands out it's for you to see there's something in there that's very important because god almighty is holding his own hands ultimate security and you're not getting to it nobody is what is it what's in there well let's try to answer that we'll do it in one in a minute or two now a strong angel steps up and he'd have to be a strong angel because he's going to have to be heard in all the departments of the universe if ever one of them they got it turned up huh he's tough these angels so this mighty angel cries out who's worthy who's worthy to take the scroll and break the seals thereof who's worthy he's in all dimensions he hid that whoa whoa now we know some things about the scroll some things we do know just from the context from which the whole scene occurs first whoever opened it had to be worthy to open it somehow they had to qualify for it to open it so that makes you think right away just anybody could do this worthiness somehow was the prime requisite to open these seals if be qualified anybody to open the scroll and start to break the seals you better be qualified to do it your prerequisites better be there <laughs> it had to be somebody significant and distinctive especially qualified person to break those seals who's worthy someone had to conquer something to be able to tape that scroll and break its seals for when someone was found their qualification was that they had conquered they overcame they had prevailed they had earned the right to break the seal Ooh, yeah take that scroll and break a seal who are you and somehow that scroll had something to do with redemption because when they celebrated its opening they find they saying that were there thou to take the scroll and break a seal for thou was slain and did purchase for god men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation it was associated with necessity of redemption furthermore furthermore whoever could take that scroll and break a seal and open it and reveal its contents would become the adjudicating factor in history the adjudicator or as we go into the sixth chapter which we could barely make reference to tonight right now the one who did take the scroll and break a seal was the one who one after the other in breaking the seals released into history a powerful god-ordained principle every time every one and the one who could take the scroll and break the seal was the one who could determine the future of history that's powerful the future of the human race was inscribed in that mysterious content of the secure document that scroll and whoever earned the right to take it and break it open with the ability 
to, to take it and break it open. They received the authority to determine the outcome of history, all of it, for the first principle that would be loosed when that scroll was opened was a, a principle of symbolically describing as someone riding on a, a white horse taking off down the corridors of history and it was decreed what should happen to him. He would go forth conquering and to ultimately conquer. Whoever breaks the seals is in a position to determine what shall happen to mankind. And the very first seal makes declaration that the one symbolized by the white horse is the one who will ultimately conquer in all of the varied aspects of history. Every one of them, varied as they may be. You think, Selah. Now the opener of the scroll would mediate the revelation of all future things. John must have known, he knew that. John must have had some insight into the significance of the scroll. John, John knew about that scroll because of a strong angel. When that strong angel said who's worthy, John knew, John waited. How do you know? How do, Mike, how do you know you did that? There was no response. He began to weep. He expected that somebody would, would open it. How come he wept? Because he had some idea of what that scroll was. This scroll was, was the title deed to mankind, to history. God had it. He took it in the Garden of Eden. Satan didn't get it. The great God had put that scroll in the hand of a man. Back in the beginning of time, he did that. We read about it in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 and 28. Having said in the Holy Council, the triune Godhead, let us make man in our own image. And uh, the Holy Three, with creative genius and infinitely perfected brilliance, molded and made the highest of created beings, a man. I still don't to this day understand that, but built into all those systems brand new, every one of them inside of him. And as this magnificent creature lay in earth and ground, God looked at him with admiration. Said, look, look at that. Ooh, look at that inert form he made. He stooped down and, and kissed it and breathed into its mouth a breath of life. And it sprung up to alertness and stood upright on his feet. And God had made one in his own image. But he was not a toy. He wasn't a plaything. He was not some kind of infinite diversion for a lonely God. And I'm lonely and I just think I'd do it. <laughs> this creature was to become God's vice regents of that whole earth. The earth was going to be his. This small dot in the universe at the end of the universe is so fraught with significance it's unbelievable. I've thought about that many times. Man eventually made their way to the moon, came back and said, the moon was a barren blob. There wasn't nothing. There wasn't, there wasn't a stirring of life there. There was no microscopic life. There was nothing there. And I said, praise the Lord to myself, the earth. This only points out to me that all these great swirling orbs around the universe is, there's one that God in his sovereignty degree has picked out that he filled it with seeds of every kind and an infinite variety of animals and birds and microscopic things and little beings and little human beings. And there's things here that are unbelievable. Rock formations and streams and a variety of flowers. It's the arena of God's activity in the cosmos. You want to see God? Come look at this place. And we all look at the universe and go, oh, it must be God. A lot of people don't believe that, but I do. But the real place is here. This is where the action is. He didn't put him in charge. He didn't put this whole thing in charge of a baboon, a monkey, something that climbed out of slime. No, no, he didn't. This man was he was sub, magnificent, submitted to him as magnificent. He made it the end of his whole creational act. He made a man after everything else. He said to that man, he said, 
You're my representative, Adam, and I want you to subdue the earth. I want you to multiply your kind on the earth, and I want you to reproduce. I want you to fill the earth with the population of you. I don't want you to abort your seed. Don't do that. I don't want you to kill it in, in infancy at all. Don't do that. Hallelujah. Don't, don't do that. You know that's true. That's not what he said to do. He said to go make more. I want you to fill the earth. Subdue it. And rule over it. Adam must have been... He must have been beyond our imagination as far as magnificence. He was not some slobbering simian sneaking around prime, primeval form knuckle dragger. He, he wasn't that. No. He was not a piece of primeval protoplasm that floated out of the mess and these waters. The protein hit it just right and the rays hit it right and we developed ears and noses and so forth so on. No, no, that never happened either. Nope. I never did believe that even when I wasn't a Christian. He was fully developed. All man, magnificent. I think when he stood up, he was godlike. I think the Adams went, oh my God, there's one of him. And well, that's moral and intellectual. It's not physical, right? Uh, if you want to fuss about that, go ahead. But I think that, that it was interesting when God wanted to materialize down here, he made a man. He always did. And furthermore, when God wanted to most accurately incarnate his highest ideas of a time history being, he did so by causing the Logos to snuggle in the virgin womb of a little peasant girl called Mary and be born with a human body. It's something for you to think about. I don't think Adam was thought. Morals. His body too. He didn't have any genetic flaws. Yeah, you've got to think this through. He had no inherited warts or problems or, or DNA problems or chromosome problems. His bloodstream was pure. His nervous system was pure and in order. All systems would go. He was ready. He, he, he was a man. Now, if you can imagine that magnificent creature, can you imagine the exquisite nature of his companion, Eve? It was, she wasn't taken from mud. She was taken from refined flesh. And if you looked at that magnificent man and this exquisite creature by his side, he said to them, I want you to produce your kind. And I want you to train them how to handle the garden. And if they multiply, I've provided you with four rivers out of the garden that will go the four directions of the earth. And these four rivers become your highways by which you'll export the life of the garden out into the earth until a time will come when the whole world will embraced in the life of you lived in the Garden of Eden. That's the seed. Uh, nothing's, I don't think anything's changed since then. Nothing has. It hadn't changed. God is once more in redemption putting together a, a people who, like Adam and Eve in the Garden, will pick up the mandate of God and will so start to live together in community that will produce the beauty of the Lord out of that, a generation of children, and we shall export them across the world. And we'll see Marxism and occultism and all the isms that are diabolical and distortions of truth driven back into the dark places and crevices of hell. And the earth shall be filled with light. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness, do it doesn't arrest it, doesn't comprehend it. The light's going to win inevitably. You stand in a dark place and, and take your cigarette lighter and light her up. Darkness is expelled. It can never win. Never. Never. It may look like it's going to, but it's not going to. Ever. Slithering into that primeval, same comes in the serpent in the garden. I'm slurping in, slithering in. He confronts our four parents and succeeds in their downfall. Lies to them and tells them that if they'll come out from underneath the headship of God, that God knows in that day they'll be gods on their own. That day. Adam was the first. Well, wait, Satan was the first human, really. The serpent said to Adam, You understand, Adam, God is afraid of you. He's jealous of you. That's why he won't allow you to eat the fruit of the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. That tree of the day you eat of it, you yourself will be, be gods. You'll spin worlds off the ends of your fingers, too. 
He knows that. He knows it already. But the minute Adam and Eve partook of the eye-opening fruit, they realized that there were no worlds spinning off the ends of their fingers. Nope, no worlds. They realized that they were naked and uncovered, and they made fig leaf aprons to cover their nakedness. And they hid stupidly behind the trees from infinite all-seeing God. And they knew that, and they registered the first awful tremors of fears that ever hit the human race. Came from, came from Satan. Now from that point, when Adam forfeited the authority to unfold history, which he was supposed to, Satan inaugurated another one of his many lies, right away, of course. That lie was, since Adam had forfeited it, the authority to govern now is mine. It'd been turned over to Satan. That's not true. That's a lie. God reached down and took that scroll out of, out of, out of, out of Adam's hand and said, I'll hold this until a man comes who can open it. Now, so remember, dear people, the Bible clearly says that the world was not made for angels, and it wasn't. When God was incarnated in Jesus Christ, the writer of the Hebrews is very careful to say this, and very specific to say that he did not lay hold upon the seed of angels, but upon the seed of Abraham did he lay hold of, and he was made in all things like his brethren. Earth history is not the history of angels. It, it, innocent or fallen, it doesn't matter. It's not the history of, of, of supernal beams of transcendent creatures at all. History and the world, as God made it, was made for man. The sooner you understand that, the better off you are. When he made something in his image, it was a man. He gave a man authority. He, when he was incarnated to redeem, to redeem his whole inheritance, he made a man. He was incarnated in a human being. He was born of a virgin. This world was made for man, and before history winds up, man is going to be restored to its original place as the vice regent of God's earth, and God will see it and see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. And he was. That's how I see it, and that's how it is. No other way. Now, John knows. That if somebody is not able to take that scroll, that history is down the drain. If somebody doesn't take it, he starts to weep and cry about it. Why? Because there's no answer. And the Bible is very careful to tell us that from whence there is no answer. It tells us where. Now, I was just wondering this. Of the three areas mentioned, where, where should we stop? Shall we speak first to heaven or the earth? Or under the earth, where where should we stop with this? This is this a no. That when the great angel opened his mouth and said, "Who's worthy of take the scroll and break the seals thereof?" His satanic majesty, uh, with his characteristic big mouth, gets involved in everything. He didn't say anything, did he? Not a word. Now, if all his lying claims have any validity why don't you step up the plate and see what happens see where it matters let him come forward if he wants to run this joint let's see if he can open those seals let him speak it's chances now isn't it he claims to run the world he claims that he got the scroll when adam forfeited if so let him step up take it out of the hand further go furthermore if he's got the scroll how come god's got it why is it in the right hand of god if he has it and even now, he believes he has the right to it. Let him say so. Now, this great fallen creature cringes in the shadows of hell, surrounded by his minions, his demonic underlings, all his little lieutenants, as they all cringe and characteristic cowardice as they do. They don't stir to respond to that great angel. They're quiet. Hell has no claim to us. Not a bit, not a lick. No, not none to history. It doesn't claim it at all. Cannot claim it. Hell has no claim to history. Now, we have, we, uh, he's a coward. And we have cowered at that shaking and shivering of that fear of that because everybody tells us how powerful Satan is and how much the, all the movies and everything else that make him powerful. Now, he has been given prerogatives in the permissive will of God, but he's not God. He's a creature. And he's on the end of a chain, and the other end of the chain is in the hand of the King of Kings. 
and he can only go so far as he'll let him go, and that's it. And that's all. That's all I see and all I read. I believe it. I believe it. We're doing a description here. These are signs. Now, what are we going to say about Earth? We talk about under the Earth. Now, about Earth. Alexander the Great. How about him? This man who, as a young man, sat at his tent and wept and cried because there was no, there was nothing else to conquer. No one to conquer in this world. How the sinister. Oh gosh, how many are there? How many venereal disease killed him? <laughs> it not him to a premature death. Syphilis. He could conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer the tie to his own body, killing him. Perhaps a Napoleon. How about Napoleon? Or Mussolini. He's all loud mouth. Half insane Hitler. <laughs> Nuts Hitler. And how about half the, if not more of the Stalin who's bestial. Here's another monster. Genghis Khan or Nero's. How about any of those Nero's? Did they, did they move up and lay claim of that scroll? They all said they were. Half of them were God. Got ate by worms. And it was quiet, silent. No kings, no great men. No tycoons, no economic giants and military experts. I wonder about the millionaires and billionaires and richest men in the world now. What do they think? There's no response. And one of heaven, that archangel. Maybe Michael can do it. How about heaven? Let's see if heaven can do it. Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, he can go out there, right? Somebody. Somebody in heaven? Seraphim or cherubim. Somebody. Something. Maybe something in heaven can do it? Nope. The ranks, of the, the ranks of the angels were quiet and silent. And John said, there is no one, no one, no one to open that scroll. Men's going to perish. And he starts to weep and crying and weeping. And he's standing there in the midst of the universe and lamenting the awful fact that there's no one worthy to open those scrolls, to take it, break the seals, and unfold history for us and bring it to a benign conclusion. And as he's weeping, someone taps him on the shoulder and says, don't, don't weep, John. Stop crying. It's okay. Stop crying. There's one worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's one. There only needs to be one. Only one. Not all of it. Only one. Hallelujah. There's one. There's one, John. John lifted his eyes up. What did he see? What did John see? Posing myself, just one, another one. And he knew, this John. He knew. When somebody tries to sell you a bill of goods, a distortion of the truth, too, and suggest that in redemption we become equal with Christ, don't you ever think it? No, you tell him. There's only one. I saw it's the only one. Sense of God, we are to be sure we are, but. As long as time and eternity should wind its way along, there's only going to be one begotten Son of God. Only one. That's Him. God will never have any other sons like that one, ever. He's co-equal, co-eternal, co-substantial with the Father. And the Spirit, the only begotten. Eternally begotten. He's begotten Son of God. There's never going to be another one, ever. There's only one. And don't weep, John, there's one. He says to him, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. He's conquered. And so as to open the scrolls. And seven seals, John. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah was a lion tribe. And the lion of the tribe is the best of the tribe. Jesus was the best of the kingly tribe of Judah. Not only that, but he was the root and sprang from David. And it was to David that God coveted with, out of his loins, he'd raise up one to sit upon his throne and fulfill the destiny of his people. That's what he told him. And now the elder identifies to John there's the one, there's one up there. 
who he is in history, and what he is in eternity. He says he's a lion of the tribe of Judah. He is able to take the scroll and break the seal, John. He says, it's him. And John wipes his tears away. He knows who he is, but he looks around. He knows what a lion is, too. And he looks for a lion. He looks up there. What does he see? Something emerges out of the throne. What is it? That's not a lion. Now, you see we're in the realm of symbols now. We always were. As he looks at the throne, there comes out of the throne a lamb. Expecting a lion, he sees a lamb. And that lamb is a strange lamb. Read it. And that lamb emerges as he comes out of the throne. And John looks at him closely. It looks like he's, it's just been newly slaughtered. Blood all over his neck and his wounds. It's fresh on his wool. Red blood. What, what does that mean? Oh, oh, put it in simple language. It's the language of simple people. It's, it's this. Simple. The blood has never lost its power. It's fresh blood. Never. No, never. No, never. If the book of Revelation was written A.D. 96, our precious Lord had already been in heaven many years, a lot of years. And yet, as John sees it, in a symbolic form as a lamb, the blood is still fresh. It's fresh and blo blood, bloody on his wool. Fresh, clay. Fresh. It's eternal and unchanging. It's, it's uh, as educated in the, in the blood. Blood of goats and boats dried up and cracked up and scabbed up at Jewish altars everywhere. But the blood of Jesus Christ that bore in the presence of the Father, that blood is still fresh. That blood is ongoing. It never loses its value. It never loses its, its efficacy, its, its freshness. The blood in heaven is fresh. It's legally valuable. It's good tender in heaven, for sure. That's fresh blood. That's what John saw. The blood and bulls and goats couldn't take away sin, but the blood of Jesus did and does. Still does. Never lost power, never wanes. Now there's something else about that lamb. It's not only covered with fresh blood, but it has seven horns. Now I'm reading a lot of this, so give me a, a minute. The horns are a symbol of strength, and seven is the number of completeness. The horns are strength. This bloody lamb has got heaven horns, seven horns. But didn't the elder say the lion? That's what the elder said. He said the lion, yes, but that's a lamb up there. I know it. But you must understand the significance of symbols. The lion authority of Jesus Christ derived from his lamb sacrifice. Jesus Christ is a lion tonight. He's a king of kings and lord of lords because the greatest enemy that he defeated was the enemy that he defeated at his cross when he made an end to sin and destroyed Satan's power and won a great victory. Jesus on the plains of Golgotha, he single-handedly at Golgotha, he slew principalities and powers and wicked spirits in high places. He made an open show of it. He, Satan saw him dying there. He said, I'm going to send some of my best princes for him. I know this is the one. Now the people die. He sends undertakers over to get him, you know. But for for him, I'm going to send my best princes. And he did trot out some best princes. And he claimed the body and soul of Jesus as Jesus hung on the cross. The Bible says that these princes claimed him the soul of Jesus. The Bible said, if he didn't notice it, unless he gave you a revelation of it, if all we had our senses, we would have joined the crowd and said, oh, poor man. He's ignorant prophet. He's all torn up. He doesn't even look like a man. He's so torn up. He seemed to be a nice man. That's the best senses could possibly do. But when we come to the word of Revelation, Revelation draws back the veil. And behind that mangled, blood-spattered body, the drama unfolds of history. It unfolds. As these princes come to lay hold of his spirit and bear him off to Hades, the Bible says that he flung them off. He's slinging them all around that cross. He slings them off. Slings them off. Those bulls. Sling them off. If you had eyes to see it, you can look around the foot of the cross and see all these demonic princes laying there with torn up, broken up. Slung them off. Broken noses, splattered faces, broken arms. He slung them off. That's what it says. I don't think it's metaf metaphorical. He was never more kingly than when he hung 
you know, Golgotha, on the bloody congealed sweat of Gethsemane mingled with the dirt and blood of those five bleeding wounds. And not looking like a human being anymore at all. Isaiah said that. He's all swollen up and messy. You know, made him, he was never more kingly. Within his spirit, he rung off principalities and powers and slung them off and single-handedly went down to meet our sins. With God Almighty and the mystery of substitution, reached down with his great hand and scooped up all the sins of mankind from all times, from all peoples, and laid them on Jesus. I can't even imagine that. I can't imagine that. He, he, and he pulled back and let the bolts of his own wrath come unhindered on him. God's wrath was unmitigatedly wild upon his son. I can't imagine that. And Jesus Christ made him soul and offering for sin. He was never more kingly than when he took the sins of man and died for him. And when he flung off principalities and powers and he surveyed the whole thing and realized, hey, I got it. I defeated them all. He made an innocent. He conquered it. He made it into sin and debts and all the righteousness of God was surveyed properly. He dealt properly with all the enemy. He pleased the Father and as he looked around he said, that's done. We're finished. It's finished. It's finished. Hallelujah. That's what he meant. The old's done. News begun. Ha <laughs> ha. It's finished. It, it is finished, he screamed at. It's finished. It's finished. Say it. It's finished. Say it in your lives. It's, it's finished. It's finished. It's done. Now, Jesus paid that price. He paid it all. All to him I owe. Amen what he did. He washed the white snow with that crimson blood. All alone, by himself, he did this. He conquered hell, death, and the grave. This is eternal David on that throne. He was out Saul's armor. He took that five smooth stones of the decrees of God and he went out and whirled one into the forehead of, of the satanic Goliath and he thundered to the ground. Boom! And and David hurried over and, and took his sword and cut his head off and took it into town and hung it up. Let everybody know. All alone he did this. Could God be the glory, he said. And, and he is. Amen. Got him. Seven horns, all authority. All authority. Other people have other definitions of this, but it's all authority has been given unto me, he said. All seven horns the Father's given to me. I got all seven of them. Therefore you go in heaven and in earth. This it's always gets me every time. I always thank God for that. Most of all the time. And I'm honored to be able to to put these recordings on. And I've always said it, it's wonderful that one of us is running the universe tonight. And they said this back in the day. He used to go to the meetings back in Nazareth. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I like to talk about him. Mary's boy. Joseph's son, little lad. Stepson, Jesus. Have you, have you watched those ball games for, back in the day? But they had Jesus playing ball on TV from South America. They couldn't call him Jesus because the sports announcers here never did call him Jesus, anglicize him. Uh-uh, he's Jesus. Jesus took third base. You couldn't say Jesus took third base. They made an arrangement years ago when the Cubans' ball players started coming up to America. They dare not in America announce that Jesus is coming to bat. <laughs> no. Nope, nope, nope. There's only one Jesus. The rest of them are Jesus. You cannot say Jesus hit one over the left hand wall. It's not going to work. Uh uh. No, 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 no. And by common agreement, they agree that they would not anglicize Jesus. And, uh, and they have him to this day. Not going to do it. You look at it and it's Jesus. Now, what's Jesus doing at the plate? What, uh, what are you doing up there? That's another Jesus. Our Jesus is not at the plate. Our Jesus is at the right hand of God sitting on that throne. That's a Jesus that used to get water for Mary and at the town well. He, uh, he and Mother Mary would come into the synagogue together. And people would say, well, oh, he's a good boy, isn't he? Jesus. Ever since Joseph was gone, he's a, he looked after Mary well. He's a fine boy. And he changed things at the shop. 
And since they took over the carpenter shop, we put up a new sign. We make better yokes. <laughs> uh, a little joke, a little joke. Yeah. Jesus. Now, when he was 12, he confounded the rabbis. He said, hey, Jesus, he's Jesus, he's the one, the same one. He confounded everybody. He's one of us now, he's sitting on the throne. If you gone to the synagogue that morning, you might have looked at him and and paid no attention to him. Just Mary's boy. Not knowing that that same boy in that same body, glorified and incorruptibleized, he's just not gonna have, it's gonna happen. Is that same boy sitting in the synagogue that morning, that same boy is gonna run the universe someday. Here we go. You wouldn't have known. They didn't know. One of us is running the universe right now. That same boy. All God and all man. He's just not all divinity pretending to be a man. Oh no, he's a man, one of us. He's got a very God, he's the son of God. He's deity incarnate. We all know that, we know that. And we recite that because that's creedal. It is. But what we sometimes forget is that when God made Adam, he made Adam to be an extension of the Trinity and authority in the earth. And when Jesus came on the scene, he guaranteed that the Adam thing would never happen again. And he said, no other than his own son in the world to guarantee it, the security and the perpetuity of his right to history and the space and time and material. And Jesus Christ was dedicated for this very purpose. And he said at the right hand of God until he stay there until his enemies are made a footstool because he's going to get the inheritance back. And that's it, period. Amen. Jesus, God knows everything. Bonus of vision, the seven eyes, comprehension, his eyes. He came and took the scroll. He saw it all, he knows it all. That's what it means. As he took the scroll, uh, let me say this to you. <coughs> Let's say something carefully about this. At the risk of being misunderstood, and I believe in the second coming of Christ, I do. But I believe that the second coming of Christ has been taught and preached and presented all out of proportion, constantly. I've known men, and sorry to have to say this, I did it at times, once in a while, who would preach we can reach out the second coming. And I never did much, but they did. A lot of people did. The second coming is an aspect of fulfillment of the first. Read your New Testament. You will not find anywhere where the disciples went around the country or the apostles went around preaching the second coming of Christ. They did not. They went around preaching about how Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. And when they get to the resurrection, the Holy Ghost would get so happy, he'd baptize some of them before they even asked for it. That's the excitement of the Holy Spirit. That was the gospel. Paul said, we delivered unto you the gospel, which you received from us. And that's how Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, how he was buried, he rose again on the third day. Nowhere, nowhere did they talk about the second coming of Christ for our sins. He rose for our sins of justification. The center of history is not the second coming. The center of history is, is the first coming, the incarnation, the death, the resurrection, the redemption act. That's the center of the universe. The second coming is, is an aspect of the first coming. The power is in the first coming. The gospel is in the power of God and salvation. Nowhere does it say the second coming is the power of God and salvation. When Christ comes the second time, he's not gonna to come to save the nations. He said the gospel save the nations, and he sent us to take the gospel to all the world, to disciple the nations. The gospel is the, the power of God and the salvation. There is no other power. It's faith power. Not a nation power either. It's not a tribe. It's everybody and everywhere through the gospel. The second coming of Christ, I want, it's, it's going to be a rough thing. Now here's what precipitated one of the greatest celebrations the cosmos has ever known. Look, look at it, verse 8, verse 7. And he came and he took the book and the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. He took it out. And when he taken the scroll, the, the four living creatures and the four 24 elders, well, they fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and a golden bowl. And he celebrated the song. Yeah. 
golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And I think that's wonderful. They had, it's wonderful. There's something significant about music, anointed music. It's just, it's tremendous. Excellent anointed music. It's just a wonderful thing. It's interesting as the results of redemption is a new song. We play a new song unto the Lord. Probably some of us have, have never got as close to the throne of our worship in, in, unless we're singing. This is, boy, it's close. It's wonderful. Whenever I need to get close to God, really close to him, I'll start singing. And those of you who play piano and guitar and so forth, it's lovely. You can sing unto the Lord. It's amazing. When Saul was pestered and bedeviled, tortured by demonic activity, he, he brought the sweet sound of that singer in to calm him down. The devil-driven psyche was just tortured. That singing brought him close to God. It's just something there. There's something there about music. It's a beautiful thing in heaven. In fact, when God created the heavens and the earth, 10,000 times 10,000, the millions of angels broke into a great anthem that celebrated the creation. They did. And many people talk about the manner in which Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem. It's true. It was a disgraceful thing. It shouldn't have been received like that. But when God was born in human flesh, the crowd heard by. That's a baby, isn't it? Yeah, they heard by, do their thing. Got to do their thing. You got to be able to know that there's more than what you see. The Bible tells us that while the crowd heard by that manger cave, and maybe they heard that baby, like I just said, maybe they heard that infant cry. That's a, that's a new baby. That's a baby of a God man. And they smiled and said, that's a young cry. That must be a young baby. But they hurried on celebrating what they were celebrating there. But here comes Revelation again. Thank God for Revelation. It draws back the curtain and allows us to see. And the Bible says when he brings his first begotten into the world, he saith to the angels, worship him. And while that little baby was coming into the world, ten thousands of ten thousand times, ten thousands of thousands of angels were back in the choir lofts of heaven worshiping God, singing unto the Lord. The whole vast array of the angelic hosts were singing. Hallelujah. The shepherds out in the fields heard them, saw them. Hallelujah. And they wait for the signal from Bethlehem's manger. As soon as that baby let his first cray, he dropped the baton and them angels started getting with it. <laughs> Broke into sound and they worshipped him and worshipped him. And they worshipped him. So did the shepherds. Now when that lamb took the stroll, the scroll, they fall down. And the first thing they read is they had a harp. They had those harps, the elders did. And they started to sing and worship sing him and they had bowls full of incense and the incense that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of smoke i saw that yeah well that's the prayers going up they're the prayers of the saints just worshiping him loving him prayer is not uh it's not useless at all it's part of god's God's part of cosmic, God's cosmic perfection is that. I don't even understand how it works half the time, but I know it does. And when Jesus was going away, he said, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. From now on, you ask the Father in my name. Whatsoever you ask, God will do it. Huh. I think we've missed the importance of prayer in the redemptive reconstruction and restoration purposes of God. I don't know why he does this, but I know it's supposed to be. Our prayers are important. I can't explain the mystery of how it works, but I know it's important. You find yourself praying and you have a desire to pray and that's the Holy Spirit in you. It's asking you to do what's necessary to enable things to happen the way they're supposed to happen. On your personal life, your prayer life, your social life, there's a relationship between the decree of God and God's people. It's a mystery, and I've never understood it. I don't think I will, but I know there are times when I have to pray lately a lot. The altar of my soul is full of, of, uh, of clouds of holy incense and sent up petitions to the Lord and certain things. When I can't even say them in English, I bottle them up in unknown tongues and send them up. I have a consciousness. That I know that I'm participating in what God's doing. This, this wonderful tablet of history that's going forth, I know I'm involved in it. I can fence it. If I can feel it, I know it. The word says it. So that's it. We got the lyrics to that song anyway. Hallelujah. Worthy are thou to
to take the scroll, to open the seals thereof. For thou was slain, purchase us unto God with thy blood, from every tribe and every tongue, from every tribe and tongue, hallelujah, from every tribe and, and tongue, every tribe and tongue, hallelujah, hallelujah, every one of them. I hope this comes to you in a way that you really understand it. From every tribe and every tongue, and people and nations, he made us them to be unto us our God, our kingdom of priests. And they reign upon the earth, and they reign. What precipitated that song? Redemption did. Redemption. They didn't sing a song about the second coming. No, they did not. <laughs> There's not one. It's all about redemption. And uh, I've been told that that's wrong. I've been told, oh, I have preached these things for 40 years and taught them for 40 years. And sometimes it was like, it was like, going in one ear out the other. Some of them just grabbed it and came up, I worship angels. They said that before. You didn't get authority to cast out demons like that. And you better stop doing that to Christians. How dare you set Christians free? They don't, they don't need set free like that. And so it, I don't care if the demons are in them, around them, or on them. I want them gone. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the first thing that Jesus did when he walked the earth here. He came in the synagogue and cast out demons. All night long, when the sun went down, <laughs> it was programmed later on when the sun came up. Went in the synagogues, he laid hands on the sick, cast out demons, people came to him. It always amazed me. Amazed me. All that's been given to us because of the Lamb. I hope that was a good teaching for you. It is for me, it always is. Father, help people understand this. Put it in their their library. Foundational as well. Make it solid. I ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this is Mike. Jesus is Lord. I'll see you next time.